We have two amazing speakers here today. I've enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyed uh, the preparation for this session, hearing about how they have rolled out their enterprise learning solutions. Um, both Abel and Emma are very, very different, have very different companies, approaches, and types of solutions that they're using. So I think by the end of the hour and 10 minutes, you all should be able to walk away with at least one to three real nuggets of um, ideas and hopefully even some approaches that you might be able to use in your work environment. My name is Sharon claffey Kaliubi. I work for State Street Global Advisors out of Boston, not London, if you didn't recognize that. Um, I'm so delighted to be here and be able to host this session as well as be a part of some of the other events here at the uh, conference. What I'd like to do now is introduce Abel Henry. He's the Learning Technology Officer at UNICEF. Um, and also Emma Pace, who's the Global Head of Talent and Learning at PA Consulting. Uh, Emma will be talking about the ability to serve up an enterprise learning solution, not only to her group, her organization, PA Consulting, but also to the clients of PA Consulting, which I think is a really neat combination there. Um, Abel, on the other hand, he is working with a small team of four people, yet he has to have a huge and very important global impact. We were both, Emma and I were both talking even there saying, you know, UNICEF, wow, that's an organization that you really feel some strength and passion behind just based on who it is. So with that, I'm gonna start with Abel and then we'll go to Emma. And just so you all know, we'll take questions for about five or 10 minutes at the end of Abel's and we'll also do it with Emma and then we'll wrap up in case you have questions that you'd like to ask both of them. Some of the same questions to see where it's going. So that way you don't have to keep it in the back of your mind and then possibly forget it at the very end. Right, Abel? Okay, Matt, so uh, just a few words about me. I'll be very quick, and uh, then uh, most of the session will be about practical developments we've done at UNICEF to respond to some of the <laughs> big challenges we have in uh, delivering learning solutions to different audiences, as you will see. So I've been working in the e-learning industry a bit by accident, I think, like many people that I've met today. Um, my background is more into politics and international relations, and I started working with the um, International Federation of the Red Cross on their um, LMS implementation, and uh, after that I joined uh, UNICEF about five years ago. Uh, in both cases, it was about building some rather innovative um, solutions um, for those organizations, quite different solutions in both cases. So today I just want to highlight some of the challenges, four challenges that we've had uh, to deal with at uh, UNICEF and four solutions that we've uh, built um, recently. Right, so the first thing is that um, when I arrived, there was really no system in place, but there was definitely a need to um, address a multitude of audiences. So the historical audience that we've been um, working with are UNICEF staff, so about 13,000 staff um, globally. Uh, but definitely, we also had a big uh, pool of uh, consultants uh, working with us, and uh, I would say the first level is also the um, national committees of UNICEF. So uh, you're probably familiar uh, with your own national committee, whether it's the UNICEF UK, UNICEF France, UNICEF Denmark. Uh, you have a kind of a, a local organization that helps fundraise and advocate at the um, country level. But we also find that um, for the support of many programs, we need as well to share learning resources with our partners. Uh, we are leading in a number of, of fields when it comes to disaster response, for example. So we're leading in water and sanitation, in education and emergencies. So there's a need for us to share our expertise with those partners and uh, build a common language, a common practice. So that's the first challenge. Uh, we're locating around uh, the globe. So I think officially it's around 190 countries with, with the presence of UNICEF. This is actually the map of the usage of uh, our LMS over the last year um, of usage. So we still have one big challenge, which is to get Greenland. Um, but apart from that, uh, we call that the Nuke challenge. Uh, if you know anyone in Nuke, I, I'll take it. But apart from that, we are actually covering every single country in the world. Um, in the usage, interestingly, is actually, it doesn't show so much on this by country uh, map, but the, in by region, we are actually having East Africa and West Africa as the, the lead uh, regions. So when you have a web-based system, it can be at times a challenge. We're responding to emergencies, and that's actually a growing part of the, the work we do in UNICEF. 
think last year it was over 60% of staff and um, even more, like over two thirds of the budget that went to emergency response. So by emergency, we talk mostly about disaster response and uh, conflict um, areas. So that's a picture actually that um, I took uh, from our, our bank. It was taken less than a month ago when a convoy uh, managed to reach Madaya in Syria, which was a, a siege um, city. So we had a few trucks that were able to bring some um, food and, and other equipment uh, to the children in, in the area. The last challenge that we have is that we want to really be able to source the content that exists both within UNICEF but outside. So the first challenge in UNICEF is that we are not the only providers of learning activities and learning solutions. A lot of other divisions, a lot of other offices um, have a lot of, I'd say, independence. Uh, we need to tap into that um, and uh, identify best practices, collect information about what exists, and also provide services to these people who actually often do excellent work. So that will be for the, the first line of, of this slide. We also find that um, it's important to have uh, staff very well informed of what exists outside, whether it's in their region or globally. Uh, a lot of other partners, such as the UN Staff College, um, offer workshop for our staff. But also, like an example of local training opportunity that um, we want to better identify are all the language learning opportunities that each field office would have. For example, um, almost everywhere you would have a local university that ha does have either English or French uh, courses. The last one is something that I think we are all starting to, to do or, or think about, is just to tap into the wealth of free resources that you have available uh, online. There are a lot of very good quality MOOCs now that are directly relevant to the, the work of UNICEF. We have stuff on uh, nutrition, uh, public health, data visualization, that all of these are very popular now in UNICEF. So we want to be able to harness them, maybe build around those, but um, um, really take advantage of all those free resources. Same with videos. So the answer to that was to build uh, this new platform that we've called Agora. Actually, the name was chosen by our staff themselves. We had a competition. I think we got about 200 uh, names uh, proposed. Most of them were terrible. <laughs> uh, we selected five acceptable ones, and then they had a, a vote around this. So the idea of the Agora is, in, um, if you're familiar with the term, is this Greek marketplace where you exchange, where you, you meet. So it's, it's slightly beyond the traditional teaching um, platform. We want it to be a place where people go. Uh, you can have a look after the, the presentation. Uh, to the platform because uh, there's a, a public uh, facing to it and a free enrollment. So it's uh, agora.unicef.org. So just a few words on uh, the context of the project. I won't go too much into details. Uh, we've been using Totara LMS as the basis for, for this uh, project and then we contracted uh, a partner, one of the many partners uh, in the um, network of uh, Totara LMS. Uh, called Catalyst IT, based uh, in Brighton. Uh, so the advantage of uh, Total LMS, we found that it was indeed meeting most of our critical HR requirement at that time, but we could build on the platform and be quite innovative. So that's really these innovations I'll be talking about uh, later. We launched only uh, in September 2014. So probably in two years, I'll be back to tell you what did not work, uh, how, did, how did, did we fail. So. Maybe after we can have a discussion on what you think of some of those uh, directions, and I'll be happy about it. For the project itself, so we are a team of four to deal with content, to deal with platforms, and to deal with practices. So we are about, I estimate, about two full-time equivalent to work on the platform, which is probably a challenge that many of you have, a uh, small team and, and big uh, requirements. So here is the first uh, development we did. Um, it's really the backbone of the rest. It, it's just a catalog, you'll say, uh, but we really had to think hard of what is the catalog structure and what is the catalog layout that will really enable self-learning. Uh, a lot of, many of the um, open source platforms are really built initially for education purposes. So we had to rethink the whole um, architecture of that catalog and make sure it was more kind of a shopping 
site. I, I think you can recognize some of the layouts that we've stolen from uh, the big four and some others. Um, so on this catalog, you can see that we have a number of filters. So we've redesigned and restyled about all those filters to make them relevant to this particular project. So we change the database, and um, with that, we have a much more powerful way to have course recommendations in the future, to have as well, um, if you see, um, there's a number account on, on the site. So whenever you apply filters, you can also see which um, other criteria um, um, will be met. Uh, or how many courses will, will meet the other criteria. For example, here you have a count of one video, which means that you have, out of those um, elements, only one video meeting these requirements. So this was a very important uh, part of the work, and we made sure as well that this would be uh, mobile-friendly and, and tablet-friendly. So you have an example of the catalog, and here is actually the interface that we have for the, the home screen, which is very uh, touch screen uh, friendly. The second development um, we made is really to address um, this challenge about emergencies and trying to reach people in regions where you don't necessarily have very fast internet. So we've had some experience you know, with some of those uh, SCORM players. You put on a USB, you play your courses. But this was not very satisfying, and it's also, um, especially from my, my past experience, it's quite burdensome for the administrators. You have to maintain. Um, to say the library of assets, you have to sometimes package it specifically for, for the offline player. So um, this is the video of the introduction of the solution we've prepared, and after I'll say a few words about the solution. Agora, UNICEF's global hub for learning and development, offers access to learning activities such as e-learning modules, videos, resources, and events. Through its online portal, Agora reaches UNICEF staff partners and the general public from any computer with a broadband connection. Now you can use some of these powerful learning resources anywhere, even where there is limited or no internet access. Introducing Agora Offline. Agora Offline is a free Windows application that works as a companion to the Agora web portal. Download learning activities whenever is convenient for you and complete them comfortably later, without the need for an internet connection. If you are travelling, you can download courses on your laptop and complete them during your trip. If you're in a location where internet connections are slow or unreliable, Agora Offline allows you to download learning activities on your computer so you can enjoy the same familiar learning experience that you get through the online platform with a broadband connection. Once you have completed one or more learning activities, you can synchronize your progress when an internet connection becomes available to receive full recognition for your development and back up your certificates. Learn more and get started with Agora Offline at agora.unicef.org slash offline. So, um, the main uh, difference maybe between that approach to the player and, and others you, you may have seen is that we assume that people do have connections. They just don't do, uh, have connections all the time or excellent connections. So we're recommending, for example, in some of our um, offices uh, in Africa, uh, that they download uh, courses overnight uh, to not use the bandwidth uh, of colleagues when they actually need to do some other types of work. I'm not going to say less important. Um, and, and then use it when, when they can, either at home or, or in the office, without having to wait for the video to, to, to load for five or ten minutes. So, so it's really about comfort of learning, and then for all our emergency response, actually, you know, you don't want to use the satellite connections, which can cost dollars per minute, uh, and, and that's the, the way to, to go. So the second development, uh, we call it internally publishing workflows. I don't know if there's a better name to, to call that. But this is really the idea um, of having more of a crowdsourcing approach uh, to the, the catalog management. So we found that there are a lot of simple assets um, that are delivered in the field. Um, it's about having the podcast that they are creating or interviews that they are rec recording uh, locally. It's about identifying those external learning, those universities who are providing interesting lectures or English courses. Events that are organized locally, so events can be a webinar or a face-to-face -face, uh, workshop. Embedded assets, 
um, documents. Skilled soft asset is uh, quite specific, but we <coughs> also have a, a plugin to, to bring them in the, in the LMS and videos. Um, so a lot of the, the work was actually about adjusting the rights of people so that they really cannot mess up with the system uh, and still can really just uh, self-publish courses without our intervention. So this is how it, it looks. It's a rather um, traditional uh, interface um, um, just with a, a process. Nine practice, we've only launched that uh, recently. Uh, the challenge seems to be around the classifications. Uh, I think if there was a button for, for our staff to just click all of the above, they would probably select that because it's just kind of, yes, it's a video, yes, it's a course, yeah, everything. So that's the main challenge, but otherwise it works pretty well. We don't have issues with the quality of the content that people publish. Uh, I think if you are interested in publishing something, uh, there is a reason for it. It's only available to our, our staff, you know, we probably don't have less control um, in case of abuse for external users. So it's really for our staff to tell us, oh, I've seen this interesting YouTube or TED video, or oh, I'm organizing uh, this webinar. You can have some of the services of the LMS in terms of um, delivering a certificate or managing your evaluations, but it doesn't require any or very little training. We just have, uh, have a video or a webinar uh, before you get access to the, those editing rights. Uh, and I think I have an example of um, how, how this was published with the, the workflows. Uh, so you just have to, in this case, um, copy and paste your embed code, and you have a template behind, which already includes the quick evaluation, the instructions, and everything. Um, the last um, development I want to talk about uh, is called learning channels. So when we were doing uh, our stories um, around uh, the use of the, the LMS, we were left with a, a whole bunch of requests that I didn't know what to do about. It was about, oh, I actually want to have my own LMS. I want to be able to communicate about um, a particular set of uh, resources uh, for the launch, for example, of a project. We have a new talent management system or we have a a new shared service center, we have a new strategy for the organization, and they're going to be a myriad of, of different assets. So we came up with this um, idea of having, alongside a catalog, some kind of spaces where you can curate, present, and um, advertise sets of uh, learning activities and combine them with more kind of current discussions, ongoing discussions. So these are thematic le learning dashboards. That's the best way um, I found to describe them, whether they are topic-based, regional, um, with a sc regional scope. We have, for example, our Copenhagen office having more of a portal for their community, uh, or it's a large initiative. They are curated, so we always need to have a few people um, managing the channel. Many of them, but not uh, all of them, are subscription-based, meaning that the same way you, you would follow someone on Twitter, you would follow a theme here. So um, if it's about innovation, you will say, okay, I'm interested to, to see what learning activities are made available on a subject of innovation. You subscribe to this, and then you have an updates on what has been added to your um, channels um, whenever you visit the platform. They're also integrated, so... Um, can discuss that, but I, ha I don't have any good experience about having uh, communities of practice for learning. Um, there are some excellent tools out there, uh, but I found that you have to, to get people where they already are, because otherwise it's, it's, it's a lot of work to just get people used to, oh, I'm going to share this for learning, I'm going to share this for communication. So we already had a rather nice usage of uh, Yammer, so the Microsoft uh, kind of blogging, uh, tweeting uh, uh, tool. So we just integrated that as well into the existing channel. So they're really meant to be this ongoing place. So just to, to give a face to the monster, uh, this is a channel that uh, was just created for um, this initiative called Unless We Act Now. Uh, so UNICEF is getting into uh, the climate change and children um, business. Um, so you have a number of blocks, so it's a dashboard, number of blocks. Some of them are just plain um, resources. This one actually is um, kind of a feed. So you define, I want to see in this block, uh, it could have been uh, just videos that are tagged uh, with the words climate change, environment. And then if people are continuously publishing into the catalog, 
it will automatically update as well uh, this, this block. And below you have an example of uh, the YAML block, which is uh, directly embedded on, on the page. Uh, the first part uh, is more of an um, announcing uh, section. Uh, let's say you, you want to advertise that you're going to have new webinars or there are going to be new uh, self-learning modules coming soon, then you would use this space. This is another example that we've used for uh, supporting the launch of the platforms. We have actually quite a lot of people who are engaged into this one, just to get posters, to get some access to pre-release. Uh, and that's uh, about it, I think. Um, so feel free to, to email me if you have any questions. Uh, all of the developments we've done, if you are a Moodle or Dotara users, are actually um, released in an open source license. So feel free to, to reach out to us. Any questions for Abel? Hi, it was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have one question you may not have the answer for. <coughs> Excuse me, yet. Um, I actually feel quite humbled that you have 190 countries. I have a lot less than that in Europe. And I still have um, broadband and uh, issues like that. I think you have a better excuse than I do. Do you have any data yet on the amount of courses that are either downloaded or looked at live and a preference by any chance? Not yet. And actually, the, the biggest surprise I had that, that was that there was not such a difference between countries in terms of number of um, connections, number of enrollment, and completions. This would be the three kind of I would compare to see if people are trying to get courses and not managing to complete them. Um, I'm, a, I'm, ex I'm thinking that actually, it's, you know, even though we have challenges in some parts of Europe, it's also highly depending on what you expect from your internet. So when we had you know, like figures about how long does it take you to load that particular course, we also asked, is that OK? <laughs> because p sometimes you know, like they're just used to take 10 minutes to, to see a YouTube video, and that's OK. So we're hoping that we're going to improve the quality of the experience of learning, which I think is quite important. Uh, you may not uh, learn as well if you have like this to, to spend uh, 15 minutes uh, to, to load the content. Uh, but it seemed that uh, in terms of usage, it was actually already quite possible. So we have a um, custom cloud behind that. Um, uh, and it has, has responded quite well so far. Anything else? Hi there, I'm Gemma from BP. I think it sounds like you're doing some really exciting stuff here. Um, in particular, I was interested in the offline support that you give, because we have a similar challenge that some of our regions that we're in um, have no connectivity whatsoever, so that, that was really interesting. Um, one of the questions that I had were, um, it seems like there are a lot of kind of formal learning pieces in here, so kind of courses that you might do in your own time. What is the approach in terms of performance support for Agora? Um, it seems like in the field there'd be a lot, a lot of call for that in terms of how-to videos on the go and that kind of mm. thing. How does that factor into your strategy? It's also one of the, the things we want to address with the self-published uh, content. Uh, we don't have really a lot of time to identify all those needs. Uh, the organization is adopting um, an approach which is uh, to decentralize as well learning. So we would have, uh, for example, for all the self-learning related to IT, which is uh, a big uh, area, a specific uh, learning officer who is trying to identify you know, like the, the best uh, others. We tap a lot into free resources because we feel like there's a lot already existing. Um, yeah. Yeah. But we're also fine. I don't know, personally, uh, when I want to kind of um, find a solution to, to a problem I have, I still go to YouTube and not to, to the platform, so. Hello, Virginie from Unilever. I was wondering, at the moment, it feels often learning is quite passive, so we consume learning which is available. How do you turn this around, sorry, with the workflow, and encourage people to learn and go into this informal learning and share what they have learned with others? Yeah. Is that, did you find a way of really leveraging this? Yeah, well, we were a bit lucky, I think, because people were starving of learning. <laughs> um, historically, it was mostly about getting the most senior people access to some workshop. Uh, there was no platform, so just like a number of CD-ROMs shared, you know, with uh, e-learning courses. So we had this huge crowd of um, admin support staff and uh, the national officers, as we call them, so locally recruited staff, which really, Brought, brought together the entire community. They were really the driver for the launch of this system, and they really engaged uh, a number of their colleagues. Um, so we were 
I was kind of surprised of how quickly the, the system took off. Uh, we have about 60% of uh, potential users connecting uh, every quarter, which I think is quite good, and 40% per month. Um, and almost everyone has at least connected um, uh, to the portal once. Um, so for the informal um, uh, part of, of learning, it's really the, uh, getting this idea that people are responsible for their own learning. We're also having this discussion about their careers because the organization is not really into um, providing career paths. You, you really have to, to manage your own skills. So it's really about the, around the culture that we're doing that more than um, adding many other features. Great. We're going to take the, any other questions at the very end. Uh, thanks to Iris, who I saw was tweeting.